first homework assignment was officially due half an hour ago, but it got extended until Saturday morning very early. You have two more days. So if you already did it, fine. Remember that you get extra credit if you do it two days before it's due. So the problem you've done so far is going to get the credit. Jack, any that you do this afternoon also learn how to do credit. Um, there were there are a couple of people. Well, I don't know. There were some people that had problems with the homework assignment. Um, I want to cover a couple more things that you should know already, but it seems there are several people that don't. Uh, so where we left off last time, are there any questions or problems people are having? Okay. So where we left off last time, remember, we want to find the area under some curve between, say, here. Take a specific example. So let's take the function 
y equals the natural log of x. And I want to write a limit uh, which represents the integral from 1 to 3 of on about this long so I'm talking about that. That. Okay? So this will be, so I'm gonna, this is going to be a quicker question. So I'm going to give you some choices. You're going to tell me which one's right, and then I'll tell you whether you're right or not. Uh, so Limit is n goes to infinity of the sum of 2 over n natural log of uh, 1 plus Just so you know, the point of these clickers is not to take attendance, but actually to see how many of you understand questions like this. I don't personally care about attendance. Um, if this lecture doesn't like, give you anything, then, you, then there's no point in coming. If you don't, you do but that's my opinion. So I don't actually take attendance. But I guess I do. That's not the same. Okay, we still have some people answering here. People need more time? Okay, give you another 20 seconds. And if you want to talk to the person next to you, it's okay with me. Okay. 
So time to get out up here. Everybody got their answer in? It's going to answer? Okay. Can you stop them? Okay. So uh, very few people like answer one. That's good because answer one is garbage. And very few people like answer D, which is also good because that's garbage. And so 35% uh, of people think it's B, and the rest think it's 51%. So about half of you think this is the answer, and about a third of you think this is the answer, and the rest like A and D. So let's, uh, I guess, do this problem. These two are very similar, except this one has a 1 here, and this one doesn't. Yeah. Sorry? They're all from I to N. But we take the limit as N goes to infinity. So in some sense it's from I to infinity, but if we put from I to infinity, then we're adding up big numbers. So we have to have the width shrink and the height vary. So that's why we have to go to N and stop. But then we take the limit as the number of slices we take goes to infinity. So in terms of the picture, it's kind of like this, except this picture is not the same function. Except my, as I take n bigger and bigger and bigger, these rectangles get really skinny. So my picture looks like, my picture looks like, well, this is one like this. And so when n is really large, each of these things is a rectangle from one Okay, so let me draw a slightly bigger rectangle. So here is a typical rectangle here at some x i. And this formula, which is written right on the board, tells me, oops, I'm going to 1 to 3. I'm sorry. Um, at some point, my width is always b minus a over n. Well, all of these have a 2 over n, so that's cool. So, 2 over n is fine because this is b minus a. And then we have to figure out, well, how tall is this rectangle? So we have to think. We're going to chop up the region from 1 to 3 into a bunch of little pieces. And we're going to add them up. Well, how wide is any given piece? over it. So the width here is 2 over n of each rectangle. If I move over n spaces, so for the first one, I move over one space, how far have I gone when I start at 1 and I move over one step? I've gone 2 over n. So x1 is 1 plus 2 over n. Because I start here at 1, and I take a step, size 2 over n, and there I am. And x2 is wherever x1 was, plus one more rectangle, which is 1 plus 2 over n, plus 2 over n more, which is 1 plus 2 times 2 over n. And x3 is 1 plus 3 times 2 over n. And x22 is 1 plus 22 times 2 over n. So in general, xi is 1 plus i times 2 over n. And so if I go over here to xi, this is sitting here at 1 plus i times 2 over n, and the height is f of that w. So that means that I want f of 1 plus 2 over n times i. But f is the law. And then I want to take the limit. So this crazy looking notation is just a way for us to capture this idea. And we just have to be a little careful about chopping it up. There's a problem on the homework that I got about, yeah, go ahead. It's a number between 1 and n. So, here, i is 1, and then it's 2, and 
and then it's three, and then it's four, blah, 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 and then it's n. So it's representing which rectangle? Your eye is one, your eye is two, your eye is three. Since I don't know how many rectangles I have, I just have n. Maybe n is a hundred, maybe n is a million, maybe n is five. I want to write the general rectangle one of those guys. So I have to have it end on i. Now these limits are a pain in the neck to calculate. So we're not going to do it now. Um, what was I saying? It's also possible to go the other way. You see a limit like this and you say, what area does this represent? That answer, that question doesn't actually have a single answer. I mean, let me turn the question around. Suppose I have, I'm not going to ask, ask this as a quick question. Uh, n goes to infinity, i is 1 to n. Uh, so let's just leave it as a block. Let's, let's actually do the same question. Fine. So I have this limit. Now we already know that this equals the integral from 1 to 3 of the log of x x. Because we just did the problem the other way around. We already know that. But it also equals the integral from, say, 0 to 2 of the log of 1 plus x dx. This is the same. All I'm doing here is shifting my picture by 2. In this picture, I'm thinking, Okay, here's the log of x, and I'm going from here to here, and I want that area. In this guy, instead I have a different function that's moved over by 1, the log of 1 plus x. This is the log of x. And instead I'm starting at 0 and going out to 2. Those are the same area, I've just shifted over a little bit. My notion of what x is has changed, but they're the same. And I can write infinitely many different variations on this piece, but they're all the same thing. So if you have a question, write the integral which this represents. That's not a reasonable question. That's like saying, write the name of a student in this class. There are lots of different names in this class. There's lots of different integrals that this represents. They all have the same value, but they vary. Okay? Um, I don't want to, nor do I have time to, spend a lot more time on this. This is supposedly stuff you know, so I want to move on. As I said, so any questions on this? So as I said, doing these limits explicitly tedious and nasty, so we don't usually do it. Just like in, uh, in, uh, okay, uh, just like in taking derivatives, we don't usually take derivatives by the limit. We learn some rules and then we use those rules and away we go. But to get those rules, sometimes we have to keep going back to the definition. So, many of you, those of you, well, I guess all of you, have probably already seen something that turns this into um, something we can do a little easier. So, so here's a theorem, which says that if uh, f prime let me use f and g because sometimes, so, let's use g. If g prime of x equals f of x, 
So that means the derivative of g is f. Then the integral from a to b of f of x to x is just g of b minus g of a. So that in other words, if g is an antiderivative of f, then to do this integral, we just evaluate the antiderivative that each end. So an easy example. We know that uh, let's say derivative of square 2x, we know that the integral from say 1 to 3 of 2x dx is x squared evaluated from 1 to 3, which is 9 minus 1, which is 8. So this should not be news to anybody, I hope. Is there anyone for whom this is news? Uh oh. Maybe you don't want to Maybe you Maybe you're a smart guy. Um, so. Well, okay. So, so this, this is actually half of something called the fundamental theorem of calculus. another half we can write in a minute. The reason it's a fundamental theorem, or the fundamental theorem, is it interrelates two very big things that you do in calculus. It says that to do integrals, you have to know about derivatives. You don't have to. Knowing about derivatives is good to know about integrals. Now, if you remember what I said last time, that uh, the theme in calculus is if we understand microscopic detail, then we understand macroscopic or full-size behavior. This is, again, a version of that, because the derivative here is microscopic information. It says, how is the function changing on a very small scale? And we can relate that to how the function changes on a big scale. So, one thing that we do in this class is we prove stuff. No, we don't. I do. Why would this be true? So that's what it means in math. Is you give a solid explanation to prove something. You give a solid explanation of why it's true. I'm going to give a mostly solid explanation. It's maybe solid to you. Uh, I'm going to gloss over a number of the details that are mathematically subtle. But why would this be true? Well, we can do it in a fuzzy way. Uh, well, maybe the fuzzy way is no help. Does anyone have a clue why this is true? Really? No, oh, you do. Okay. Why? Right. Well, that's what the theorem says. Integrals and derivatives are opposite. But why? Right? So, I mean, yes, it's true because integrals and derivatives are opposites. But it's like asking, why is the sky blue? Well, because it's just many angstroms. I mean, I don't even know. Anyone know how many angstroms represent the wavelength of blue? Right? You know. So, the sky is blue because the light that comes from the sky is blue. That's not an answer. I mean, it's an answer, but it doesn't tell you why. It just tells you it is because it is. So, okay. So, has, has anyone seen a proof of this? Okay, you just forgot. That's okay. One whole person in this room has seen a proof of this in their life. Two people will get this proof. All right, so why is this true? Well, let's think about what's going on with this integral. It's my function. You chop it up into a bunch of rectangles. 
and um, I evaluate, well, let's just give them names, x1, x2, blah, 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 xn. So let me take, not take the limit, let me just do it at n. So we know that this area uh, Well, let's start with the right. Let's start with the right side. So G, this is B, and this is A. And so G of B minus G of A, I can write in a different way. This is G of Xn, and I'm going to write G of X1 way over here. And then, just for fun, I'm going to subtract g of x, the one before, and add it back. I didn't do that for me. Maybe I should have done it the other way around. So this is zero, so nothing changed. And then I'm going to do it again. But I'm going to leave dots, because I don't want to do it again, and I still didn't leave enough room. So I'll put it down here. And then I'm going to get down to g of x2 plus g of x2, and then uh, g of x1 plus g of x1. So nothing changed here. Just did that. And so those are certainly equal. Now, let's look at one of these little pieces. And there's a theorem that you probably forgot called the mean value theorem. Does anyone remember the mean value theorem? Some of you, okay. I guess I'll do that back over here. Okay, so one of you that remembers the mean value theorem, do you remember it enough to tell me what it says? Yeah. Okay, but you don't remember what it says. You might be confusing it with the intermediate value theorem. Yeah. Okay, can you say that in order? Yeah, okay. You know it, but you don't. So, the mean value theorem, which you went over in your calculus class because it's important, but it seems stupid, says that if I have a nice function, I have a differentiable function, uh, and this is, well, now it's g, but it doesn't matter. So let's call it, oh, we'll call it g. So if g is a differentiable function, and it goes on some interval, then if I pick two points, uh, let's call it xi and xi plus 1, so those are two points, then the slope from here to here uh, the slope of the line through G of Xi, so Xi, G of Xi, and the next guy those are my two points, which usually you call them A and B, but I already used A and B. And the slope of the line through there is the same as the derivative for some point in between. So there's some place, at least one place, this place, where the slope is the same. 
Another way to say this, you're driving your car in the New Jersey Turnpike. They hand you a ticket when you get off. You go 75 miles, and an hour later, they hand you a ticket when you get on, and they say, you are speeding because you traveled 75 miles in one hour. You must have been going at least 75 miles an hour sometime. So the slope, the speed, is the same as the average speeds here. We don't know when it happened, but we know it happened sometime. Maybe you were only speeding once, but you speed it. OK, so that's what that says. Now, why is that useful here? That's useful here. I guess I want to write it differently. So that means uh, G prime, let me call it CI because it sits between them. So that means that G prime to CI is the same as G. This is the slope of the line, and there's the derivative. So the slope of the line there is the same as the average of the two ends. OK. Uh, so the hell it, let's call this thing H. So that means that H times G prime of CI is this difference. Now let's look at this. We've got a whole bunch of things like that. So I have a whole bunch of these differences that I can just replace with derivatives. Right? This guy, since I'm going to take the limit, this guy is g prime of cn times some number h, where h is the distance. And this guy is g prime. Actually, I don't need to replace them. Let me leave them over a thing. Sorry. I, I confused myself. Anyway, notice that if I divide everything by h, I get a bunch of different scores. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I made a mistake here, right? Uh, I can't do this one. That one's not good. Okay, so I subtract, I add and subtract, add and subtract, add and subtract. So this is what I started with, and this is what I started with. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now what have I got here? I've almost got what I want, because now I have bunch of derivatives sitting there. Uh, I'm trying to turn this into an image. So, so what is this? So I guess I'm going to write it over there. Sorry, I keep pointing back and forth. So that means that I've just shown that g of b minus g of a is going to be, well, that first thing over there is h times g prime of cn. And the second thing is h times g prime of cn minus 1. And the next one, h g prime of, C of the next one. And so on. Why do I have to see it? So I have a sum of derivatives like this. Well, okay. Now I'm going to take the limit 
as h goes to 0. h is the width of the little rectangle. When I take the limit as h goes to 0, this doesn't change. But as h goes to 0, the number of terms goes to infinity. So this is the same as n going to infinity. Well, what is this? This is exactly something that looks like, so h is the width of the rectangle, right? And g prime is the height with a different function. And I'm adding them up. I'm going to take the limit as the width goes to 0. Or the, or the the number goes to infinity, and this is the integral uh, it's an x. So it's magic. In other words, what's going on in terms of the picture right here? In terms of the picture, I've got this thing, and I replace each of these guys with the slope of some place in between, and then I let them shrink to zero, so I'm adding up more and more and more and more slopes, and I get the area. So it's fat. So this tells me that I can just do antiderivatives to do it. Now the other way around of this, of this the other part of the fundamental theorem says that if I have an integral, now this is a little bit more brain hurry, I suppose. Suppose that instead of just having, well, let me see before I get to the other part. Instead of representing areas, definite areas, I want to think of functions defined by integrals. So if I have some function, here it is, and I start somewhere here, I want every, every place I stop, like here, I get an area. Right? So if I move a little further, I get more area. So this is actually a function. I can define my function to be the area underneath the curve. I go a certain distance, t, and then I stop. So an example of this, we know from physics that the derivative of position is velocity. The derivative of velocity is acceleration. You can think of this as being the graph of the velocity, and I want to know the position. If I drive my car at 60 miles an hour for one hour, I know the position is 60 miles away. If I drive my car at 60 miles an hour for one hour and 10 minutes, it's 66 miles away, and so on. The same business here. I'm defining a new function as the integral of the old one. So this is the integral from where I start up to t. Oops. Yeah, that's a T. Of my old function. Okay. So I'm going to define the function. The variable here is not x. The variable is t. It's where I stop. Not what I did in between. Now this 
fundamental theorem tells me, well, that I can take the derivative of such a function. Second part of the fundamental theorem says that if g of t is the integral from anywhere to t of f of t dt, then the derivative is just the function that I started. So these two together tell me that derivatives and integrals are inverses of one another. In terms of a picture, this is telling me that the rate of change of the area is just the derivative. I mean, just the function. Like, I want to look at an area, I move a little bit, then the amount that this changed, the area here, here's my area, and I took some area, and now I moved the end a little bit, how much did this move? Well, just the height of the function, that's how much I move. The width of this is just the height of the function times how much it moves. Right? So those two things are related. This one is, is a little more subtle, but it's also extremely important. Let's uh, write something on this. So, let's use the same problem.
Okay, let's uh, change the problem a little bit. That's almost the same thing. So, not G because I already used G. Do 
Well, let me do this one first. Suppose I want to do the integral from 1 to 3 of, uh, say, x squared dx. So using the fundamental theorem, this tells me that I just need to find a function whose derivative is x squared. So a function whose derivative is x squared, well, the power here is 2. When I take the derivative, the power decreases by 1. So I would guess that I'd need a third power. But when I take the derivative of the third power, I get an extra factor of 3 that I don't like. Here, there's no 3 sitting there. So I just divide everything by 3. And it's happy times. So this guy is just going to be, um, oops, what did I do wrong? No, that's right. So that means that this is x cubed over 3, and I plug in the values from 1 to 3. So this is 27 over 3 minus 1 over 3, which is 26 over 3. So that was pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Anybody confused by that at all? OK. Suppose, though, I have something that looks slightly different. Say I have integral from 0 to 2 of x plus 1 squared dx. Yes. Now, I don't know off the top of my head um, a, function, a function whose derivative is x plus 1 squared, but it looks a lot like x squared. So what I do here is I say, gee, I wish this x plus 1 were really x. Well, maybe instead of x, let's call it u. And then the differential here, when I change x a little bit, u changes by the same amount. And so that means that this becomes, and so also, when x is 0, u is 1, and when x is 2, u is 3. So in terms of u, this becomes the integral I just did. Okay. No, from 1 to 3. So x goes from 0 to 2. When x is 0, u is 1. Because u is x plus 1. And when x is 2, u is 3. Because u is x plus 1. So when I write everything in terms of u, this is u equals 1, u equals 3, x equals 0, x equals 2. I want to emphasize, and I'll say more about this next time, it's important to write this dx and this du. These are akin to using the units in science. <coughs> dx is like meters, and du is like feet. Now here, I've just shifted my feet by one, so they're the same. But in other examples, which I don't have time to do today, but I will do on Friday, dx will vary. 